And we, we are for the last talk of the day. We have a, a particularly inspirational talk. And I would like to introduce and please welcome Cesare Rocchi. Thank you. Thank you. So how was the conference? It was great, right? Let's give a round of applause to all the organizers because they put together a great event, right? And let's also thank all the speakers because I know it takes a lot of time to put together a presentation and I saw speakers in the backstage tweaking the slides and deciding which detail include or exclude from the presentation. And I saw speakers helping each other in rehearsing and that gave me a great sense of community. So double thanks to all the speakers. And of course, thanks also to all the attendees because a conference without attendees is not a conference. Now, this presentation has a little twist. I happen to have a hat, and I'm gonna be sincere and frank throughout the whole presentation, but when I put the hat on, I'm gonna be extremely sincere. So, you don't even have to listen to me, just watch for the hat, right? And finally, this presentation needs a little preface, a little preface, which is the story of my life, which is the sto specifically the story of my life and the way I relate to software. But I'm going to keep it short, so bear with me and don't worry. So I was 12, and my cousin got gifted with this thing, which was attached to a monitor and also attached to this thing, a cassette player, a data set, technically speaking. So you put in a cassette in there, you press, you rewind, you press play, and then you wait for the counter to get to a given number that you have to know in advance, and then you press pause, and hopefully, at that point, you have a prompt on your monitor ready to accept your commands. And my cousin, besides the computer, had also a bunch of books full of words that looked like gibberish to me, but I was told to read them out loud and to be extremely precise. So tell me when there's a space, tell me when there's a new line. And my cousin was in charge of typing. So after 30 to 40 minutes of reading out loud and typing, we ended up with something like this. Or a parable, or a sphere. And so I grew up with two beliefs that computers are meant to transform something th that is on paper into something else still on paper. And the second, that computers need two people to be operated. But luckily, after a few months, new passions kicked in, soccer, skateboard. And so I didn't touch a computer until I was 21 when a dear friend of mine bought a computer exclusively to play FIFA 98. Somebody remembers that game? It was pretty cool, right? And so the computer came with a bunch of boxes and it took us two to three days to figure out, you know, all the connections and the cables. But once we got it set up, I mean, we played for days over and over again. And after we got, got bored, we've noticed a little box that came with the computer, but well, we didn't open that, because, you know, the computer works, we can play, who cares? But, uh, you know, out of boredom, we opened the box and there was a modem. So we started, we connected the modem and we started wandering around this thing called the internet, running searches on Alta Vista, if you remember, and chatting over ICQ. So at that point, I also bought a computer, so instead of chatting face-to-face -face as we used to do, it was way cooler to chop from home using ICQ. And in the meantime, I was studying a discipline which is very close to computers, which is philosophy. And I'm half joking when I'm saying that. It's, they're closely related. But I didn't see myself as a philosopher. And so during the last year of the university, 
I decided to do what they call an experimental thesis because I got into uh, AI and specifically natural language processing. And so I spent the last year of my university as a re at, at a research institute. And I remember the first day I stepped in, in, in the institute. I mean, I was pumped. I, I was full of knowledge, full of drafts of paper that, in my opinion, were ready to be published at major conferences. And after a few days, my mentor asked for a short chat, blunt, and he said, we don't do theories here. If you have theories, that's fine, but you need a way to prove them. Otherwise, we can't publish papers. And they were so into this theory and practice thing that I had this printed on the walls of many offices, and it's always fascinating. But essentially, I was cornered. I had to learn programming. And I was lucky to meet a bunch of people, very smart. And my first programming language that I learned was Common Lisp, and this is a bragging right. I felt free. I felt like playing with clay. I had a lot of fun. I was not forced to save a particular struct named in a particular way on in a particular file named with a particular extension. I was not forced to pick between functional or object-oriented programming. I could do both at the same time. I was able to prove my theory. The point is, I ended up with a program running in a terminal. At the time, the institute was running Sun Microsystem machines. And so we had a lot of problems in showcasing this software. We needed a UI. What's, what's the option? Which are the UI options on an X Windows system running on Sun machines? Tickle TK, of course. So easy. So we hooked that up, the, the, the list program with Tickle TK exchanging messages over TCP IP. Fascinating, but after a few weeks, headaches. And at the time, Java was becoming rampant technology. Object-oriented is a solution to all of our problems. And so we progressively switched from Lisp to, the Java, on, to Java on the back end and on the front end with Flash because we wanted our application to run on this thing, and which luckily ran a pretty scaled-down version of the Flash player. And so I remember when we ran our demo, we instructed the speaker to be short, like at most 30 minutes. Otherwise, that thing would run out of battery. I enrolled in a PhD, but I didn't see myself you know, following the natural path of the PhD student. So becoming a researcher, and then a, a, an associate professor, and then a, prof, a professor. So after the PhD, I, I graduated, and I started consulting, freelancing. And this was almost a year before the iPhone was announced. I was doing fine, but when, when the iPhone was announced, I was super pumped and jumped on the train right there. And this is what I wanted to do forever, essentially. Client work was coming in. It was not a problem to find new projects. So at this point in my life, I thought, I have it all figured out. I want to build software till the day I retire, and that's it. During weekdays, maybe spend some time on site projects during the weekends, that's it. But life is that thing that happens when you're busy making other plans, and this is a quite literal interpretation of the sentence. So we had a kid. But I still was able to manage doing client work and being, building some mildly successful applications of mine. I had less time to spend on site projects during the weekend, but it was fine until we had a second kid. Now, I'm sure all the parents in the audience are, can relate to this, but it doesn't have to be kids. It can be anything, any big event in your life, in every phase of your life, that brings in a change that you cannot ignore. 
It can be the loss of a dear friend or a parent, a big company hiring you or firing you. You can inherit a fortune or lose a fortune. Just a big event or a small sequence of, of smaller events that brings in a change that you cannot ignore and you have to adjust. And here I struggled quite a bit. With the birth of a second kid, of course, we needed a bigger house. And so while I was struggling mentally, I was also restoring the house. And I rediscovered the joy of manual jobs and the satisfaction that you get when you see a floor that you tiled yourself or, or a wall that you painted yourself. And in the meantime, while struggling, I was also listening to a lot of podcasts. And one hit it. I subscribed to the, to the TED conference uh, podcast, but also after listening, I also watched this talk about a pretty famous graphic designer. His name is Stefan Sagmeister. And he lives a pretty interesting life. Instead of working, 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 working till on 16 or, or 60 or 70 and then retire, he said, let's take the retirement time and spread it along the way. So every seven years, he takes one full year off. Closes the studio, bye-bye. See you in 365 days. He travels, reads books, and so on and so forth. Gets new inspiration. And I thought, okay, probably I cannot take a full year off, but I took some inspiration. And that's how I discovered the power of part-time. Part-time as in half of the day, I'm in front of a computer doing my thing, the other half of the day, I'm away from the keyboard. I'm not in front of a whiteboard trying to sketch an algorithm. I'm not taking uh, calls with clients and so on and so forth. I'm away from the keyboard. So, but, but there are drawbacks, of course. The first I had to deal with is I keep a file. It's called ideas.txt where I keep all my ideas and that grows more now because I have less time to work on my ideas and products, and so that grows more. And I have time off now, so I come up even with more ideas and more inspiration, and that file grows. The counter part, interesting in this case, is that whenever I look into that file, I know I have a limited amount of time, so I try to pick the best of the ideas in that file. The second drawback, though, is there's less time to learn. I like, I like to learn, and at the moment, st I'm still able to block two to three hours, usually for me, Friday in the morning, to experiment and play with new libraries, new frameworks, new patterns, and so on and so forth. But there are also advantages. I have more time for myself to reflect, to read books, to spend time with my family, of course, and to live the moment. I'm much more focused when I sit in the computer, sometimes stand, you know, I have four hours. So, and this is the goal for the day. So I gotta get it done. So no fiddling with Slack or random browsing on the web, just getting work done. And I approach work also with less drama. Drama is in, oh my God, this feature is so big, I'm never going to get done with that. Or I'll wait to work on that f the next week because I know I have a full day available and so I can get it done. Now I just roll with it. I start and whenever I get, I pause and pick up again the next day. And I also developed strategic thinking and so when you have a problem in software, you know, you, you ask yourself a bunch of questions. The first is, can I solve it? The second is, can I solve it quickly? So can I toss out some potentially throwaway code 
that helps me to see and figure out if I can implement this. The third is, you know, now that I, I know I can do it, I, I want to do it elegantly. I want to do it in a do it in an idiomatic way. And I also want to keep an eye on performance. The fourth phase, which I recently, I mean, discovered and barely touched, but it's a kind of nirvana to me, is can I not solve this? Instead of struggling with, you know, coming up with different solutions and hacks, can I can I afford to not solve this? Can I avoid implementing this feature, for example? Okay, maybe a few existing customers are going to delete their subscription. Am I fine with that, with that trade-off? And finally, I discovered the power of small. Grow, grow, grow. Grow some more. It's not enough. Grow, grow. We need more. We need to grow the number of customers, the number of downloads for our app. I mean, we are surrounded by podcasts, blog posts, books, conferences, trying to persuade us that we need to grow. We need more. And this is probably propelled by the Silicon Valley, in which, you know, the hockey stick growth is mandatory if you're chasing the next round of funding. And where everything is more or less measured in terms of number of eyeballs per second per inch. The power is small. I'm sure you've heard that size matters. And going from there to the bigger the better, it's easy. Now, let's put aside for a second all the nasty interpretations that you might have of the sentence. The more customers, the better. The, the bigger the team, the more client work I can take on. The bigger the market, the, more, the bigger the potential income. True-ish. But is it worth it? Because, you know, we all know the main melody, grow, 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 grow. So I'm here trying to sing the counter melody, trying to show you that there's power in starting small and sometimes even in staying small. And so when you listen to both the melody and the counter melody and you put them together right now or tomorrow or next week, you'll get to enjoy the, the, the final song. The power of small, how does it work? Well. In the 70s, IBM was the king, I'd say the emperor uh, of, the, of the PC world. And out of the blue, two dudes in a garage, we all know the rest of the story, right? Now, I'd like to touch on three topics. The power of a small market, the power of a small team, and the power of a small launch. Let's start with the small market. Big comp companies usually don't tackle small markets because there's not a lot of money to be made. And usually it's not worth the effort for a big company. But for you, if it's just you or a small team, maybe it's enough to make a decent wage or a nice secondary income, for example. Ads in a niche, small market is usually called a niche, Ads are way cheaper in a niche due to the lack of big players. And so they are much more cost effective. There are usually fewer competitors, so it's easier for you to stand out. And the most important thing, at least to me, is that in a niche, you get to talk to the real customers, to the real people that are, that are having the real problem that your product is trying to solve as opposed to the enterprise context in which you usually you talk to a bunch of managers that represent a bunch of managers that represent the people experiencing the real problem that your app is trying to solve. Let's see a few real world examples. This is my favorite so soda pop shop. 
It started as a grocery store in LA at the beginning of the century. It's run by John Knees and his family. And they've been able to build, and build a sustainable business for almost a century. They also have a shop online, if you're interested, selling sodas. Now, we all know that the soda market is dominated by huge players that I'm not even going to mention. But John and his family has been able to carve out a niche, a niche, sorry, of people interesting in some, interested in something different, alternative, indie, I'd say. For example, the, the werewolf owling ginger beer or the pumpkin spice tonic which you probably never heard of. And that's fine, because you're not part of that niche. But John has been able to get in touch with this community and build a sustainable business within the community. Are you seeing the power of small already? Let's see what happens when you have a small team. You can move faster. That's undeniable. Let me tell you a quick story. A few years ago, I joined a startup, and we were just two developers and the CEO. I was in charge of the front end, mostly JavaScript and iOS, and the other developer was in charge of the, of the back end. We essentially talked via HTTP. We had a spec, and as long as our apps or our components, you know, respected the spec, we were fine. We use GitHub, but we could have used two shared folders somewhere on Dropbox. We never, ever had a merge issue. And I remember I was committing directly to the master branch. I felt, I felt like this. But then the company grew. We hired more people. We, we had to put in place formal documents, a process, and agreeing on a time slot to have a meeting took more time than the, having the meeting itself. And I could not commit to the master branch anymore. And so, you know, the drill, even for a small change, I had to branch out, do my thing, run the tests, and then make a pull request, and then wait for code reviews, and then if everything is fine, merge. And don't get me wrong, process is fine, because you need a way, different, you need different milestones along the way to catch up new bugs or regressions. But, it, but, a excess, but an excessively convoluted process enlarges the distance between you, human being working on the product, and the customer, the human being using your product. So not to mention that a convoluted process can also impact uh, developer happiness, often overlooked. So there's a balance to strike there in a, in a, tr in a trade off to be made. The smaller your team, the faster you can move. And that's a competitive advantage. So make the most out of it. Because in a bigger team, you might have, you might be stuck with decisions, for example. A friend of mine, his name is Luke, worked at a company. They had an app that allowed customers to browse used cars. So instead of going to the dealer, you'd browse the car you're interested in. And so when you go to the dealer, you go straight to that car. They had an iOS app. They had an Android app. They have a web API. Now, Trouble has many masks. And one of the masks is usually an innocent sentence that somebody drops, usually at the end of a meeting, we should, or even more subtle, a question. Should we? But in the case of Luke's company, it was a sentence. We should probably move to a more modern technology for our backend. So at the time, they were running a, a Java backend with the Struts framework. No judgment. And so they started you know, thinking, okay, where, what, what should we move to? The team was made of seven people. That's an odd number. So it should be easy to come up with the majority, right? 
Two wanted to go with Rails, two with Node.js, two with Django, and one was like, I don't care. And so they started having meetings and arguments, and people teamed up building toy projects to highlight the features of a framework over another. And after a month, more people joined the meetings and more arguments. If you check in the dictionary, one of the examples of the definition of long is the discussion that you can trigger when you ask a bunch of developers, VI versus Emacs, or tabs versus spaces. But if you check the dictionary for the, for the definition of endless, one of the examples is the conversation and the number of arguments that you can trigger when you ask a bunch of developers to decide about a technological stack. And so, after at Luke's company, after two months, they decided, in the end, to stick to the old framework. And one team member even left the company, probably out of stress. The bigger the team, the more complicated can be the decision process. So. Keep that in mind. If you're in a small team, take advantage of that. Let's see the advantages of a small launch. Now, you are ready. All the code is committed and merging the master branch. All the tests pass. There's just one small action left. You press publish and then your application goes live. But there's a voice in the back of your mind. Because your app, of course, has relies on a backend. And that wo voice doesn't go away. And says, will it scale? What if famous blogger writes about us and a lot of people sign up, and our servers melt. And let's go back to, the, to one of the masks of trouble. Maybe we should postpone the launch in six months. Now, nowadays, if you have a credit card and enough money attached to the credit card, you can sign up to services. You can sign up to services, and you move up a slider and proportionally, the balance of your credit card goes down. But you can you know, keep up with this fantastic scenario that you have in your mind. But a few observations. It's a very nice to have problem. It's probably not going to happen. I really wish you so but it's probably not going to happen. And third, instead of postponing the launch in six months, why not considering a soft launch? Why not launching to your friends or a small group of people that you respect and, and that can provide valuable, harsh feedback to give you an opportunity to tweak the layout or improve the captions and the labels of your app. Take, for example, Buffer. If you're not familiar with Buffer, it's a service that allows you to schedule social media posts, supports Twitter, Facebook, Google+, Pinterest. But they started with a very simple page, web page, explaining the product and just the integration with Twitter. They've noticed some interest. And then they put up a second page with the pricing. And they still noticed some interest. So long story short, after a few weeks of launching the service, they collected the first customers, which is great for your motivation, by the way, if you're just getting started. A soft launch is simpler to manage, much simpler. There's less drama because it can be seen just by a limited amount of people that you usually trust. And by the way, it's not even an original idea, because restaurants do that all the time. 
you buy or rent a new place, and then you restore it. Here's the kitchen, here's the restaurant, here's the bar. You hire waiters, bartenders, cooks, but they've never worked together. And if it's your first time, you don't even know how many waiters do you need in the restaurant. And if the waiters get along with the, with the kitchen staff. And so you do a soft opening. You invite your friends, your family, and then again, they can provide feedback. I've been waiting for my dish for 20 minutes. We are friends, so that's fine. But probably if I were in a commercial restaurant in a real setting, probably I would complain. So you should work on that, and so on and so forth. Casinos do that all the time. You, did you ever watch Ocean's 13? Not a lot of people? Okay, good. No spoilers, but there's a pretty nice scene with Al Pacino running a soft launch for a casino, testing the machines, testing the stuff, and so on. And it's also pretty common in the world of theater. When you move your show to a new theater, you need to get acquainted with the stage and also especially the backstage. And so with the soft launch, you invite just friends and families and they can help you with that. Now, let's see a few tricks that I exploit day to day to stay focused and, and small. The first, you have heard that many, 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 many times, but I feel a rehash is okay. Set a time limit on whatever you do and break down your tasks in small tasks. Because this helps, well, first of all, you keep the end in sight. So you're not overwhelmed by the feeling that, oh my God, my goal is so far away, I'm never going to get there. Second, it simplifies your planning because it's way easier to reorganize and, and shuffle a list of small tasks. And third, it also fosters some short-term success. I like I, to wake up in the morning and, you know, close a few small tasks right away so it gets me up to speed. And the second that I struggle a lot with is limiting the set of features. In some of the presentations yesterday or today, we heard that it's hard to say no to new features, especially if requested by customers. I'm not sure if this is more difficult, but it's difficult saying no to features when you devise your own product. Because, you know, when you start, it's always, it's all ponies and rainbows, and I'm going to have Web API and an iOS app and an Android app and then a documentation for Web API so people can build on top of my platform and blah, 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 blah. But when you start working on that, you soon realize that you're never going to ship that product. And shipping is a feature, is the most important feature. Is it an open source project? Okay, put it out. Is it a product free? Okay, put it out. There's a price, put it out. Shipping is a feature. Plus, having a small set of features helps you with, and I'm gonna drop the M word, marketing. A big, full of features product is difficult to explain. There's lots of features, so you have to decide the story, the timeline, the script that you follow when you describe your product. You're gonna need many web pages explaining all the features. You're gonna need longer videos that people are not probably going to, going to watch because your product is full of features. As opposed to a small product with fewer features, it's much easier to come up with a short video explaining the core of the product. And you also, it's much easier for you to come up with the elevator pitch and the, the web pages and so on. And finally, yeah, while we are at marketing, Let's talk about this. So you have your product ready. And uh, the picture that I have in my mind, you know, there's potential customers on one side and your product on the other side. 
And that's quite a jump. It's quite a jump for your customers to get to your product and quite a jump for your product to get discovered by, by customers. But when I picture this as a pond with frogs and water lilies, things, at least to me, get simpler. Planting more water lilies in the pond helps and simplifies the path for your customers towards your product. For example, one of my services is for, is for podcasters. Now, I could join a Facebook group or a Slack group, chime in, say hi, because I'm polite, and then drop a link to my service. Hey, I built this for you. Just check it out and buy it. Just that, that's the recipe to be kicked out right away from any kind of community. The other way is joining the community before building a product or as you build a product and then build trust, get acquainted with the people in the community, make clear that you are there not exclusively to sell a product but also to provide value to the community. But that takes time also. And in the meantime, that doesn't prevent you from planting more water lilies. One of those that I have exploited a few months ago was creating an RSS validator. So a podcasters have to submit an RSS feed to iTunes, and sometimes iTunes generates gibberish output because there's an error somewhere. And it's pretty common in podcaster forums or Facebook groups, hey, I have a problem with, with my RSS feed. Can you help me, please? That's a hook for me. So now I can fit in the conversation right in and say, hey, I built this. It's free. Check it out. Paste in the URL of your RSS feed and let the machine run. And if everything is green, you're fine. If something is red, you have a human-friendly description of the error and the link also to some website that can help you to solve the issue. And somewhere in that page, a very discreet link to my real service that I'm selling. So a water lily that brings my product closer to my potential customers. And there's many of them. You can run interviews or blog posts or guides for people just getting started. And I'm sure you know your community and your field much better than I do. So we it's much easier for you to come up with ideas within your community. But essentially, if you can and don't have a big budget, plant more water lilies around your product. Let's see a few examples of companies that started small. Some of those stayed small, some grew, but it's fascinating to look, for example, at Basecamp. Ever heard of Basecamp, the 37 signal? Now, they're, they're, they're not a publicly, publicly traded company, so they're not forced to share any number. But they've been around for 14, probably 15 years. So I feel I can say they have many, 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 many customers. And you know, it's easy for me to think they must have a huge team behind. Do you know how many people are working at Basecamp? Want to take a guess? No, not seven, <laughs> but 50. And that's everybody, CEO, CTO, designers, developers, DevOps, janitors, everybody. They are a self-funded company, so they have been able to grow organically hire smartly. When you're self-funded, you don't spend some VC's money. So you're much more careful in hiring because that means cutting a piece of your check every month to hire somebody new. But they've been able to grow organically and create a very cozy and familiar culture at the company. And so as far as I remember, along 15 years, just one person left the company. Let's see Quip. This is a company, this is VC funded. They have been bought by Salesforce a few months ago. They are, they are VC funded, but apparently they didn't spend money on engineers because they have a pretty cool product that works on 
every desktop, Mac and Windows, every tablet, Android and iOS, every phone, Android and, and iOS again. And they have a team of 13 people, including the founders, which probably don't even code every day, eight hours a day, or given that we, we are talking about a company in the Valley, 16 hours a day. But they've been able to, you know, make smart choices about architecture. I know that they have a C++ library shared by every other client and component, so they build native apps and with native UI on top of that shared library. And finally, you can have success also if you are a solo developer, a one-man band show. Have you ever heard of desk.pm? Nobody? Okay, that's fine. It's a blogging application for the Mac. Now, there's no shortage of blogging applications for the Mac. And yet, John Saddington, the guy behind Desk, has been able to create a delightful product that has been featured by Apple multiple times, that has won the Apple Design Award twice in a row, that supports Tumblr, Blogger, and WordPress, so the most famous blogging platforms, and that has been built in 10 years. So take your time. You can take your time to build your delightful product, even if it's just you. Bigger is not always better. Don't feel jealous of a bigger team with bigger apps. They might, might, might have a lot of inertia, for example. They don't show it. You don't know it, but they might have. And relish the advantages of being small, or a small market, a small team, and a small launch. And question the need, your need of growing just because you can. Do you want to give up the power of small? It is better to take many small steps in the right direction than to make a great leap forward only to stumble backwards. That's a Chinese proverb. Now, what is your next small step? Thank you.